Hello amateurs, welcome to another episode of the Amateur Rugby Podcast, here to help soothe your Sunday morning hangover with some wonderful rugby chat about the grassroots of the game. I'm your host Tim and I've got another fantastic guest for you today. This man played for Strathmore RFC, running out for his last competitive game at the ripe old age of 48. He's run the Scottish Prison Service National Team and has since returned to Strathy as a business consultant with remarkable results. Please welcome Mr. Nick Welsh. Nick, how are you? Good. Hey, folks. <laughs> welcome to the show, mate. Now, listen, I always like to start off with how people got started in their game. Talk me through how your sort of early playing days, how you got going in rugby. Probably most people, you know, I am following on from school, played for a local club, um, quite enjoyed it. Picked up a couple injuries, drifted away from the game for a wee bit. Um, I actually joined the prison service uh, when I was 23, 24, moved up to Aberdeen. Um, at that point, Grampy and police were looking for me to play for them, but I kind of shied away from it at that point. Couldn't afford to pick up injuries, just joining a new job, etc. Um, but when I was about 30, I was at a barbecue, and of course, sort of a ball gets thrown about. Somebody says, yeah, you've played before. Like, well, everybody plays, you know. So, I was actually going through my physical education instructor exams at the time, so I was quite fit. The guys were like, do you want to come along and play? And my wife says, why don't you go and play? You're training anyway. And I knew what was coming. I went, like, if I end up playing, at training, I'll end up playing. And so the, the deal was, yeah, but that's fine. You can go and play, you can go and train, as long as you take the kids with you. So I've subsequently <laughs> had... To- Two girls that were brought up feral run about a rugby club and been there ever since. Amazing. So why, apart from the injuries, were there any other reasons why you kind of drifted away from the game at all? And how did no. that kind of, did you miss it while you weren't playing? Yeah, yeah. Um, took quite a bad knee injury at the time. Uh, it took quite a bit to, to come back. And it's kind of plagued me throughout, throughout my life. It's not stopped me. Um, Knees are completely shot now, I'm afraid. Um, it's, it's just one of those things. It's just one of those things, yeah. But you managed to carry on playing until you're 48, which is quite <laughs> remarkable, really. Yeah, and, and, and beyond, realistically. Probably not at any decent level, but like I say, enjoyed the game, just enjoyed the contact, enjoyed the banter, so kept going. And what position were you, Nick? What was your, what was your type of style of game? <laughs> I started off out in the wing. Uh, centre for a wee bit, got a wee bit older, a wee bit slower, played back row for a long time until eventually started playing front row, any position in the front row, but predominantly hooker because nobody else would go in. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's remarkable. I love that. And that's one of the great things I think about kind of community social rugby is that you can start on the wing and end up almost yeah. anywhere, sometimes even yeah. in the same game. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, it's good fun. Good fun. That's happened. Okay, tell me about this uh, prison service national team. Obviously, you mentioned there it was part of the job, but what kind of level of rugby is that and what kind of challenges did that come come with? Yeah, it's because it was a bunch of guys that didn't train together. It was everything from under under 20 Scotland level down to just club players. Um, and that was one of the challenges, putting a team together because you didn't have the pick of positions. Some of the times you just had to play with what you had, um, play people out of position a lot of the time. Um, but because we were playing, for example, like say England and Wales service, the, the pool that they've got is phenomenal. Um, <laughs> to the point, you know, that there was guys with Welsh caps you were playing against. It was pretty, pretty heavy duty. Um, Northern Ireland service, that was a wee bit more like us. It was guys that played club rugby um, a wee bit. Because they're a smaller community than we've got a couple of prisons. Everyone, they, they had a chance to play and train together. Whereas realistically, we had people from Inverness down to the borders playing. Training just didn't really happen. We were lucky if you had two or three games a year. Um, but again, treated in the spirit of the game. Made a lot of friends during that time with other services. Um, and that was good, good fun. It was a good fun. Yeah, I've, I've played for a few teams that kind of sound similar to what you've just described there. And there's something really special about it because you don't get the normal preparation time that maybe you're used to in your sort of club career. Is that something you kind of leaned on a little bit as a point of difference? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
And when, when you think back, probably one of, every time, we went down to play England every year. And, you know, literally nine times out of ten, we got absolutely spanked. Um, but one year we went down, we played, we were playing down in Liverpool um, at the old St. Helens ground, rugby union ground, not the rugby league ground. Um, and that was back in the days that they still had the bath. You know, it wasn't just showers. They had the old big bath and everything. One of the worst things we've probably ever done was we beat them one year. Oh, my God, the next year they threw everything at us. But we enjoyed that particular day. <laughs> we enjoyed that day for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so what other, what other teams did you play? Was it just the other national fire services? Uh, sorry, uh, prison services? Or was there other teams that you played as well? No, um, we played against police teams up here. Um, we played against Army Battalion Scotland, um, which, again, started off as a, a bit of fun until they got more and more Fijians playing for them, which was just, then I just took it to a different level. Um, and we eventually had to say, look, sorry, we just can't compete at that level. You know, enough's enough. You know, for a, for a friendly game, we just, that nah, was a different league altogether. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And, yeah, and being a national team, did you kind of uh, create some stash and, and get all some kit together or was there not budget for that? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So we... There used to be the money used to come through from the uh, sports council that we had to apply for. Um, we managed to subsidise it, you know, holding raffles and just all the normal stuff. I think the most expensive tour I ever ran for the prison team, we flew down to Cardiff to play against the Welsh service, um, and I think it cost the guys like a hundred quid, and that was like a polo shirt, accommodation, and a flight. It was pretty basic accommodation, right enough, but. You know, hey, it was good fun. It's all they needed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all you need on a trip like that, for sure. <laughs> um, now then, let's talk about Vets Rugby, because it's something that I've kind of struggled to get into. I find it can be a very sort of competitive environment. You've continued to play Vets Rugby. Tell me about your experience. Yeah, so like I said, the last game I played at Strathmore was at 48. Um, and I was finding, I was picking up more injuries at training than it was in the actual game. So we looked to, help, looked to go elsewhere, sorry, we looked to go elsewhere um, to train. So we found um, a team up in Brechin that sort of promoted themselves as a vets team, over 35s team. To be honest, back then, there weren't even that. There were just a bunch of dads, a bunch of, bunch of coaches, guys that hadn't really played before who wanted to throw a ball about. They were really weren't into contact at all. Um, until we went along and sort of introduced them to that part of the game. Um, but what they did have, socially, they met up with uh, an Italian team called Reggio Emilia, which is quite a big team um, across in Italy, in that part of Italy, who had a vets team. So they invited them across to play. Um, we played them across here. Lots of good fun. Um, decent enough game. The next time we played them was actually down in, against Toulouse over 35s, which was a different standard altogether. But what you had there was um, one team made up completely of French and the, the other team half Scots and half Italian. So you can imagine the language barrier. Um, but absolutely fantastic, um, fantastic game. I played in three 20-minute sections. First um, 20 minutes was no score. Second 20 minutes was no score. So the referee decided what he would do is completely mix the teams. So you had French, Italian and Scots all playing alongside each other, which <laughs> ended up with a one score of a difference. It was just really, really good fun. You know, just great experience. How did that how, how did you play for so long without actually getting getting any scores? Was it just a lot of errors or was defence amazing? What what was the score? A bit of both. If I, it, was, it was literally tit for tat. You know, it was a hard-fought game. Um, at that age, if typical French, if you give them to their wingers, they're going to run round you. So we had to resort to our typical tactics, stick up the jumper and just take them on up front and try and rumble it. Um, but no, they, the guys had a bit of French flair about them, but just to make sure they didn't have the ball, <laughs> which we succeeded in doing most of the time. 
Yeah. And what about what about post game, Nick? What was the uh, what was the fun that had afterwards? <laughs> so back to um, the French clubhouse. It's the only time. That's not true. It was the first time I've had proper duck served at a post match dinner. So it was top notch food. The Italians they brought a full che- peel of cheese, uh, Reggio, um, and balsamic vinegar, and of course we went along with haggis, and we had the haggis and the cheese and that before we had the French meal. So yeah, and plenty of wine to go along with it. <laughs> wow, just a complete uh, you know every, every angle of um, gastronomic experience there. Uh, it's right. So how many times have you actually sat down and someone serving duck proper duck to you? You know, a post-match lunch. You know, probably back in those days we were more used to pie and beans. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say for me, I've never had that ever. Not not single <laughs> once. So was uh, that? Did they come over and play up in Scotland as well? The Italians have, yeah, yeah. The Italians have been across here a few times. Well, actually, I had had them across last year as part of the Six Nations. Um, some of them came across not to play, but just as a visit. Um, so we hosted them down at Strathy. Um, put on a it's venison casserole, give them a proper Scottish you know meal out of it, which they, they seem to love. Amazing. Yeah. Now, talking of Strathy, I understand that you've somehow managed to create a situation where you've got players that sort of convey about of players coming through the club. <clears throat> now, I've visited a lot of rugby clubs over the last sort of three years, and that has been a sort of a real sticking point for most clubs. Seriously, the vast majority. What kind of things have you put in place to 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 make that happen? So, not long after I returned the club or returned the club to work, um, we sit, we went through a strategic planning process to set out strategic aims for the club, and that was always one of the aims was to have homegrown talent coming up through. Um, at that time, we probably had the, the junior section was probably sitting about 90, 90 players, age five up. In those last six years, we've more than doubled that. Um, making sure you've got the right coaching structure in place. So the two co-chairs of the junior section spent a lot of time and effort creating the right environment, getting the right coaching in place. Um, so the kids and, and youths enjoyed being there and enjoyed playing together. Um, and we've, you know that's paid off. We've seen we're now currently sitting with. I think it was 28 and we're under 18 section just now. And some of them are, are on the Caledonian pathway. Now, some of them will probably go beyond Strathmore. Um, but for example, last year, under 18s moving into senior rugby, rugby, we had seven 18 year olds field for the first team. Now that's phenomenal. We've not had that. You know, so the, the long term plan is paying off. You know, and that's, that's, yeah. that's ultimately where we want to be. Amazing. Now, with those coaching things that you mentioned, are there any detail about that? What type of things are the coaches doing to make sure that the, the kids really enjoy their rugby? First of all, I'm not a coach. I've got no interest in coaching. Um, <laughs> but again, <laughs> that's just that's not my skill set, I'm afraid. Um <laughs> But the guys take it serious that, you know, it's how, it's, it's a wee bit of mind management. It's how they treat the kids. It's it's creating that environment that they want to play together. And that's the whole club ethos. We we'll talk about the Strathy family. We're, we're not any different. Every club will aspire to that. But it's creating that ethos that they want to play together. They want to be at the club. Um, it's just making it easy for them. You know, there shouldn't be any obstacles in, for them if they want to enjoy the rugby and to continue the rugby. Yeah, what's the um, what's your environment like? Like, how, have you got any other local clubs around you? Is it a, a, a huge sort of area of, of humans or is it quite spread out? What, what's your environment? So, yeah, so we're quite a rural, we're the county town, Forfar. Um, I don't know, about 20-odd thousand probably live there. But we're, no, we're not a, a town side, we're a regional side. So Strathmore, if you know the northeast of Scotland, goes every anywhere from Perthshire up to the Howe and the Merns. So it's not just Angus, it's the whole, that part of Scotland. Um, so our catchment area, you know, covers all that. 
Um, the the biggest side uh, near us would be Dundee High. Now they're playing in three divisions above us, and they, they'll capture a lot of the university in that. Um, but again, it's different dem uh, demographics. So yeah, it's we. When I, when I started playing at Strathmore, I'll give you an example. Um, our clubhouse was an old wooden hut that was left over from the Sycamore War. <laughs> right? um, and we were very proud of it. It's, it was ours. But if the, the club has grown so much. Right, so we've just opened up our third extension. There's the original clubhouse, um, which has got a lounge. It's now got what we call the Shark Tank, um, which is a secondary bar. It's got a balcony overlooking the, the main pitch, which overlooks four for walk, which if you go down today, you'll probably see an osprey fish. Um, phase two was more change rooms underneath, a club gym, a gym, which is, you know, absolutely fantastic facilities. There, phase three is now we have a Pilates yoga studio with more change rooms beneath. Um, it's got two physio treatment rooms and a disabled toilet through there. Um, so again, part of the environment we provide physio for all the for every club member from age five up. And we'll work in partnership with Angus Physiotherapy. They look after everyone on game days, they travel with the teams, um, but also provide their they run yacht Pilates classes, yoga classes, see their own clients which then generates revenue for the club. Every bit of money we make for the club gets piled back into rugby. So it's, it's, it's like closing that whole loop. So I'm just trying yeah, that to sounds, know, provide you. That sounds amazing. Okay. Um, we're going to get onto the new stuff in a minute, but I want to hear a bit more about that old clubhouse. Tell me a <laughs> bit more about it. And, and I'm sure it must have been a, a kind of a sad day when that clubhouse went. But yeah, tell me a bit more about it. Yeah, so... Lots of happy memories in that old clubhouse. It really was. If you talk about strategic plan back in the day, if there was a light bulb in the showers where we're doing well, you know, the place was literally held together by Crusoe. And it was, it was just a really old, it was literally left over from the Sick of World War, but it was ours. You know, um, it, there was nothing fancy about it. It was just wood. Uh, when you think back, it was pretty dire. <laughs> you're lucky to get a toilet roll in there at times, you know. Yeah, and did but, you knock it down when you built the new place? Yeah, yeah, I had to come down. I had to come down, I'm afraid. Um, it's now part of the car park. <laughs> um, we've, we've currently got a marquee up, um, courtesy of one of our main sponsors. We have the Wine Out Lounge that was constructed by members and sponsors in the last month or so. So we had a music event last month with live bands on. Um, we have a tens tournament, not this weekend, but next weekend. We have under 18s playing on Friday night and over 35s women and seniors playing on the Saturday. So there's 26 teams playing tennis side um, rugby down at the club over that weekend followed by a live music uh, event at night. Then the following week, we have a thing called the Strathmore Sessions. So year one, we actually combined it with the tens. And we had about 500 people there in year one. But we probably tried to do too much. So last year, we paired it back a wee bit. Not so much stuff on the ground like stalls and things. Concentrated on the tens, but we took up to 1,000 people. Um, this year we've stripped the tens from the music. It's it's as DJ sets. It's for the youngsters. It's not the kind of music I would expect you and I to possibly listen to. Don't take that the wrong way. Um, but this year we're taking up to just shy of 50, uh, 1,500 people. Um, absolutely fantastic day. It makes a lot of money for the club. It's a lot of hard work to put it together. And that's courtesy of sponsors and members. It's, it's, it's player-led. You know, the tens and the sessions are player led. Um, so hands you know, hats off to these guys that get the head down. We're currently just making sure that all the bars are manned, um, everything's in place to make it a successful and safe day. Um and yeah, if you're more than welcome to come up because it will be pretty mad. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds amazing. Now just talking just thinking back to the 
conversation about the minis and juniors and all that pathway coming through. Young players now really not expect, well, maybe they do expect actually really good facilities. And if you've got that, I'm sure that helps keep them coming back and sort of attracting more people. Is that something that you've witnessed? Yeah, absolutely. So we're very, we're very aware. We're very fortunate to have the facilities we've got. Um, and probably in the early days, was one of the challenges was to make sure that the junior section saw the club as theirs as well. It used to be run like two different sections. And you're saying, no, this is your club. This is your facilities. You can use it, access it as much as, you know, a senior member. And um, so we've, we've done quite a bit of work bro- breaking down these perceived barriers. So sim- just simple things like if someone's having a birthday party, you know, they don't pay for the facilities. That's part of your benefits of being a club member. And um, we'll work quite a bit on member, you know, what's the, what is membership benefits and how that actually is something tangible that they can give them back. When did you, when these, uh, when the minis and juniors did, weren't aware of, you know, that they could use all this kind of stuff, what were the kind of things, what were the signs that you were seeing that made you sort of alerted you to that problem? Just talking to people, you know, verbally, they, they, uh, they, they weren't accessing the facilities. They would stand outside rather than come up and, you know, come into the balcony, have a cup of coffee. Um, but there would the be things we, we, we were done. Um, we, we converted an old horse box into a wee barista bar. So the, the kids that work in it are predominantly club members or played for the club. We provide them with a barista training. And so when your mum and dad or grand and grand is watching the game, they can get a decent cup of coffee and keep them warm or a cup of hot chocolate. It's, it's creating that environment that people want to spend time in. You know, rather than standing at the side of a cold, wet field and there's nowhere to go or, you know, there's no shelter, there's nothing nice to have. It's just making things accessible. Yeah, that's a great one with the, the, the um, horse box because... Well, it's a creative project in the first place. Then you're creating jobs for people as well and adding value in terms of their training, which they could potentially use anywhere where they go afterwards. So what other ideas have you had like that, Nick? Is there any other things that come to mind? Yeah, so we we took that a step further. Um, Hospitality is obviously a big thing on game day for the first 15. And previously, we've had carers come in with their own staff, etc., We've taken that in a slightly different fashion. We're working closely with a, a caterer who's providing us with top-notch, good food, just done well. But she's a one-man band. She didn't have the support behind her. But, well, we can do that. We can do that in-house. So the kids, um, I'm saying kids, the youngsters, um, mm-hmm. we we'll provide them with the training. Um, so they're our hospitality team. Now, okay, it gives them a wee bit of extra cash, but it also gives them, if they're, when they're applying for uni or applying for a job, it's evidential that, you know, they've got a work ethos, we can give them references. Okay, it might be just a certificate in hospitality, but it's shown, shown they've got the right attitude towards work. Um, and it's been such a success. It is phenomenal. Great bunch of kids. The feedback we got with them, they come in, they're br- they've got white shirts on, black trousers, black waistcoat, strathy badge top, strathy tie on. They just look fantastic. And they come in, they've got a smile on their face. And when you're actually talking to sponsors or guests, you know, well, he's playing tomorrow or he was playing an hour ago. He's in here, he's showered, he's serving up your meal. or It's just a great story to have. And it makes the, the kids feel part of it. Yeah, 100%. Now, what I'm hearing a lot of here is making everybody feel like part of the fabric of the club and vice versa. Um, Tell me about your role. We kind of talked around it a little bit already, but what's your specific role within the club? How did you get it? And and what other things have you done? I was coming up to retirement um, and I heard the club was looking for someone to take on the business development side of things. So... At that point, I was really just dipping in out of the club as a social member. So I, I, re- I reached out to them and said, well, what, is, what is he actually looking for? Because obviously, having been ex-prison service, my skill set um, was probably pigeonholed quite a bit. Um, so I 
reached out, um, spoke to the president, and so what we'll do is I'll, I'll apply for it, but don't just take me because I'm an ex player or member. You need to get, you know, for, for the club to work, you need the, the best person for the job. So I remember sitting down with one of my old colleagues and we wrote out our CV and it was pages and pages and pages of what we saw as our skill sets. So I managed to whittle it down to a traditional CV with a wee bit of help. Um, and they talk about this tran these things, these transferable skills. Well, it looks like we've all got them. <laughs> Applied for the job. They actually interviewed 13 for the, for the role, um, including video conference so uh, video conferencing with someone from New Zealand who was looking to come across. So business development, uh, the SRU had been sort of playing about with it. There was two or three clubs who picked up on it um, at the time, but there wasn't any real blueprint to work from. So I went and done a wee bit of research, picked up what I could, any case studies of clubs that were going along these lines. Um, it was quite, there was actually more stuff in Ireland than there was across here to learn from, which was quite interesting. And it was, you know, about marketing, about income generation. Um, so, yeah, it has been a wee bit of flying by the seats of our pants. It was a big step for a club, for a club like Strathy to embark on. You know, it, was a, it probably was a bit of a gamble. Um, but obviously it had to work. Or we had to make it work not only to sustain, you know, and improve the club, but to sustain the, the expenditure and blind someone like me. Um, so, yeah, I think it's been pretty successful so far. The, you know, revenue has been, it came on quite a bit. Part of it, I suppose, is professionalising how the club approaches things. And that's a big thing for me. If we're going to, you know, when I, when I started at the club, they were maybe doing something on a one week, but not able to, to replicate it the following week. Um, and that, that's really not where you want to be from a commercial point of view. So we just made sure if we were starting off at a level, we were able to sustain that level week in, week out, so people knew exactly what they've got. That then transpires. If you're doing that year one, year two, you're going to increase it that wee bit better. And that's kind of the approach we've, we've taken it. Whatever we do, we sustain it, we're able to achieve it and then move on, build on it and just keep building on that success. Yeah, fantastic. You mentioned the financial there, but that's, of course, probably only one part of the <clears throat> uh, uh, improvements that you can get. Yep. What about people? Because you must be getting so many more people in and around the club on a regular basis. Is there any benefit there as well? Oh, absolutely. So, um so we're, we're, we're actually looking to separate the club into two parts just now. Predominantly make, potentially make the rugby side a standalone charity and then create a limited company for, for the business. But it's not quite as simple as that because a lot of the time we were actually a social enterprise because we engage with the community so much. The, the term we, we like to use is we are a community club, not a club in the community. So what, what does that mean? So we, we reach out, actively reach out and support other community clubs. And um, let's say our facilities are, are second to none. For a wee backseat rugby club, we have got cracking facilities. So if we can help others, um, rather than going for the quick buck, we find that further down the line, you're actually getting more bang for your buck. Um, a recent SRU club conference, um, they talked, Talk, they spoke about social investment. And that's how you've actually quantified this in a wee bit of research they've done. So they reckon for every one pound you spend in social investment, you're actually getting eight pound back. And that's just the start of a journey. <clears throat> so if we can replicate that, that's a pretty good investment. You know, especially when it's, it's not actually costing you anything to, to allow someone access for your facilities. So the type of clubs we've opened up to. Andy Mann's Club, which is, you've probably heard about, um, the local sailing club, the local rifle, small bore rifle club, um, riding for the disabled AGMs, anything like that that we can open up and allow them access, we tend to find that further down the line, 
they'll either get a club booking for them or a donation. Or, you know, it's just people seeing the club opening, it's opening its doors and not being insular. So other examples of that, um, we host a for for park run. Now, when we first, you know, thought, oh, how are we going to manage this? All these people on a Saturday morning, especially when it's game day. So it, to start off with, it's like a military operation between the two organisations working together to facilitate this. Um, we now regularly see anything between 120 to 180 runners every Saturday morning, which then transpires. They come across and they, <laughs> they'll buy a tea and a coffee. So that's where the, the barista training and that are coming off. Um, that's then grown to we host Jog Forfer on a Tuesday night and a Thursday night, okay, which is our training night. Um, but you've then got 30 to 40 runners in addition coming down every, you know, twice a week. They then come into the club on the first Thursday of every, uh, every month. They want the bar open, they're doing a wee presentation, whether that's on nutrition or stretching or something pertinent to the running, um, which people then get access to the club and go, oh, this is quite nice. I've got a, an engagement coming off. I've got a, a celebration. How do I access the club? Or wait a minute, there's a gym through there. How can I become a member and utilise your gym? So we're seeing that increase our membership or social membership or gym membership and we're, we're bookings. So that's just some examples of, you know, how community engagement's working and working well for the club. Yeah, it sounds amazing. I, I'm super interested in as well, something you said earlier about it being player led. Some of these events are really player led. How have you managed to sort of engender that uh, spirit amongst the players or have they just shown it almost? Has it come from them directly? Yeah, well, um, it's come from the the the, 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 the leaders, leaders on the, the field, whether it's club captain or just engaging with them. You know, it's like, I, I suppose like most clubs, we're needing something done. You'll get the same group of volunteers coming down all the time. And these guys are worth their weight in gold. Because um, they, they're the guys that'll go and knock the door and come on, get down here. We need a hand with this. Um, but let's say that the DJ sets, the, the Strathy sessions, it's been such a success. Now, don't get me wrong, it is bloody hard work to get there. Um, you know, by the time you apply for all the, the council license, licenses and alcohol management plan, noise management plan, um, occasional license, you, you know, engage with the police, provide additional first aid cover. It's, it's a pretty big event, you know. It's, it's a lot of responsibility for a club. But because it's player-led, it's, it's a wee bit like playing rugby. If you're playing back row and I'm front row, I don't have to think about what you're doing because I've got trust in you because you're going to take that ball to where I need it. We can then, you know, everybody's got a role to play and you just trust them to go on with it. But yeah, yeah um, the, the players have been driving this and it's been fantastic. Yeah, I mean, one of these things I think is that if you're part of the club and the general atmosphere is one where people are trying to help and trying to put themselves out and try to improve things, then it just it makes it much easier for other people yeah. to kind of join in with that kind of uh, environment. Yeah, and, and a lot of it has actually come from our president, Bob Baldy. I think he needs to get quite a bit of credit for that. Bob's attitude is, it's, not, it's never a no. It's right, well, how do we make that happen? You know, come up with an idea. Now, yeah, there'll be obstacles. There's bound to be obstacles. But there's no point in complaining about this council regulations. You work with them and you work around them and get them in, take the advice and just make it happen. Yeah. Now, there was something else you mentioned earlier as well in terms of the food that you're getting down there at the club. You mentioned getting served duck over in France, but some yeah. of the food that you're getting served up at Strathy, talk, talk to me about that partnership and some of the meals that you're serving post-match. Yeah, so to, to, before, before we started on um, the game for the game, is what we've called it, um, we, were, we were basically paying caterers to come in and provide meals on a Thursday night for the guys to get together after, you know, after a bit of training and sit down and, and, and gel. It was about building that environment. 
and probably like a lot of clubs, they were getting pasta and sauce, and it, which was okay. But it's not really what we wanted to, you know, to be given them. So the, a guy at the time, uh, vice president of rugby, who played for the club, an ex-Marine, um, Mark Fagan, Mark started doing the meals on a, a, a Thursday night. Um, and some of that, the, the guys were maybe chipping in a couple of quid. I then took on a bit of, bit of a step. Um, one of the players, Chris Patterson's a fisherman. He would provide lobster. So we've actually had surf and turf. We've had steak and lobster there on a, on a Thursday night. Um, I've done my fair share of cooking for them. So you make sure the guys are getting decent food, you know, proper home-cooked food that actually ties in with the nutrition. So just now we're into pre-season. Um, and we sat down one, pre, uh, one pre-season um, after they'd been out on the pitch. They were sitting down and they had a bit of a talk about food intake prior to the game and all the rest of it. And it's all focused, as you'll be aware, in the last 10 minutes. Um, and that kind of got us, we got us thinking about how do we actually improve the nutrition? How can we get these guys eating the best of the best? And I'm thinking about that, not just from the playing side, I'm thinking about that from my sponsors and my members and my hospitality. Um, and we started talking to a group called Angus Glens and Moorlands Group, who are a group of estates, shooting estates um, in the area. Again, we're quite rural. Um, and we thought, all the best organic, it's on the doorstep. How, how do I get myself, how do I get that stuff into the clubhouse? And how do I start cooking it? So we managed to get them um, on board the sponsors. Um, they provide us with all our game meat for hospitality as part of the sponsorship deal. So, again, if you think about the big pictures, that's me showing other sponsors I'm supporting local employment and providing them with the best of the best of food. Last year, it was venison, duck, partridge, and pheasant. Um, We're hoping to increase that this year, maybe getting some salmon in as well. Um, So... The way I'm putting that across, how many rugby clubs do you know that are pitching out game meat as a USB? So that's that's part of the story. We're, on the big stage, we actually just won an award. We won an award last weekend. Um, so we didn't win an award. We were finalists in the Scottish Game Awards as being game champions about how we can open up game meat to you know the wider public. Because a lot of people sort of back off it. They think it's strong and it's this, that, and the next thing. Um, but what we've seen, what we've evidenced, start the year when we started doing it, people were going, no, I'll have an alternative. And then when they're sitting down at the meal and then sampling it, realise how good it is, the orders are going up. Um, so we, we expect to see even a bigger increase in that this year. But it's a great story to have. It's, you know... And I'm able to put across the best food from the area to my to my sponsors and to my guests and, and members. It's yeah, that's amazing. I can see you're really proud of that as well. Oh, and rightly yeah. so. And it's I guess the lesson to learn here for other clubs is look out who's local to you that you can work together with and create something that supports each yep. other and the, and the local community as well. Absolutely. Every club's different. It's okay to... You know, to compare against clubs, but there's no point in comparing Strathmore with a club in the middle of Aberdeen. The demographics are completely different, um, and you have to adapt. You know, the club certainly in my role has to adapt to that. Um, but the you know, to to be able to, to access that kind of food is just absolutely fantastic, and it's tasty. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Okay, let's move on to uh, rugby supporting, Nick, because I understand you are, you know, you go to quite a few Six Nations games. Tell me about your experiences there and how that all got started. Yeah, so again, probably the first game at the old Murrayfield, 16, 17 year old, um, always been into the rugby, touring. We used to, like most guys, you would go away on a tour, play a game, and then go to the game. Um, 
Some of my colleagues from the prison service, I still travel with them every two years to Cardiff, for example. Um, two years ago, I took um, Mick Steele, who's president of the English and Welsh team. He's never been to a Scotland Wales game, certainly in the millennium, or sorry, principality. So we invited him along to join us, and he was just blown away. It's, you know, probably as an Englishman, seeing a different perspective between the, you know, the, the crack between the Welsh and the, the Scots. Um, and Mick had a pretty good weekend that weekend, I think. Um, yeah, lucky I've, I've done every game home and away in the same year sometimes. Um, out with the Six Nations, Six Nations to buy sevens. We had friends living across there. Um, European and Challenge Cup finals. A um, couple of World Cups. The only one I've not done so far, it's on the, the to-do list is the Lions Tour. Um, if next year had been New Zealand, I think I would have been able to persuade my good lady, but I think she's holding off for New Zealand rather than Australia. <laughs> <laughs> That's another, another nine years to wait then for that one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, every, every Six Nations game in one year, that must have been a bit of a struggle on the liver, was it? Oh, the, the, well, yeah, I think that was a year. So our last two games were Italy, then Ireland. <laughs> so what we did, we actually made it a 10-day round tour. We flew to <laughs> we flew to Italy on the Friday, um, went to the game on a Saturday, met everyone. It's, as you know, it's a small family when you're touring. Met everyone across there. Stayed to the Thursday flew direct to Dublin on St Paddy's Day, um, went to the game on a Saturday, flew home on the Monday and went to rehab on the Tuesday. <laughs> what a remarkable trip. That must have been incredible. Absolutely incredible. Oh, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> okay, amazing. Let's let's move on to the stash section of the show now, Nick, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, we'll start with the awful kit. Are there any kits that you really sort of dislike at the moment? As an old guy, the new technical wear is great for playing in, but actually wearing on tour, I'm, 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 not, a fa- I'm not a fan of it. Um, I've actually been fortunate. I was actually across in Bologna at the end of April. And Macron, I was, I was flown out uh, with Macron to their headquarters um, via another sponsor. And we were actually taken to the Macron factory. So I don't know if you're aware, SRU were actually the first international rugby site to, to engage with Macron, but that's building quite healthily now. Um, and they've got you know quite a wee collection of um, the kit. Um, the kit, our first team, our, sorry, not just our first team, all our age group, uh, grade has Macron kit just now, and it's actually reversible. So it's uh, sublimated. So they've got the Griffin, all your sponsors are sublimated on it. So black kit predominantly. But if you need to reverse it, you'll literally flip it inside out and it's purple and everything's still there. Amazing. Um, so yeah, I'm not really sure if there's any kit I really don't like just now. It, that's a hard one. It really is a hard oh, that's one. Good. That's okay. You don't need to have an answer. That's yeah. all good. What about what about favourite kit of all time, Nick? So this can be any team from any era. Oh, it has to be a Scotland kit. It has to be a Scotland kit. <laughs> any particular <laughs> year that you like? Or just um, the, no, I, I, the, the The one that stands out is before it became the technical kit was the old cotton one with the two white bands on the sleeves. White collar. It's just... Yeah, I think I can't remember what year it was, but well, I still like that one. I might be nice. about it here, so yeah. <laughs> and what about what's about the favourite stash that you've ever received? So this is something you've been given or gifted or earned, maybe. So quite fortunate. Um, two of the local lads um, to the club, their mum and dad still stay in the area, is Matt and Xander Fakerson. So Matt was coming down. Uh, doing a bit of pre-season training at the club so I was fortunate to do a wee bit of training with him obviously miles behind him um, and the two of them have donated quite a bit of kit you know to dish out to the club or whatever or hang in the walls and that so my favourite bit of kit is actually one of, uh, something from Matt and it's a base layer 
And <laughs> so in a way, the cold, you know, the cold Six Nation games, that's the base we're aware. And it makes me just feel that wee bit closer to the team, if you can get any closer to a Scotsman. <laughs> well, base layer's pretty close, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I needed some of the times when you're wearing the kilt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, amazing. Um, okay, we'll bring this towards an end now, Nick, if that's okay. But is there anything else you want to say? Sort of any closing thoughts or messages for clubs that you know maybe want to increase their revenue somehow? Yeah, I, I, I know um, myself and a couple of guys in similar roles, you know, reach out to each other and swap ideas, um, and I think that's quite healthy. You know, if you if it's not a, an immediate competitor. And that's part of the you know the contract I've got with the club. Um, every day is a school day. You never stop learning. Um, and it, we, we joke about it. Whether, whenever we go to an away game, either myself and I've got a couple of the old farts doing it in the, the club president. You're taking photographs of everything, right? How can I adapt that to suit Strathy? What can I learn from that? That worked well. That doesn't work well. It's just continually improving things. You know. It's okay, yeah, you're doing okay, but you can always push. You know, what was mentioned about year on year about pushing that envelope. I think that's where we need to go. If you stay still, you know, we're, 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 the club is bucking the trend on every level just now. We're increasing our uh, playing capacity where a lot of clubs are struggling. We can't take that for granted. We need to keep pushing that. Yeah, 100%. Now, if people want to get a hold of you, Nick, uh, maybe to talk about some of these things, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, drop me an email, um, nicholwelsh at strathmorerfc.org.uk. More than happy to talk. Uh, and if you've got ideas to help me, I'm your man, give me a shout. Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. It goes both ways, doesn't it? Absolutely goes both ways. So people listening at home, I'll link uh, Nick's email address down there, along with everything else that we've mentioned today. And that can be found in one place, amateurrugbypodcast.com. So it just leaves me to say, Nick, thanks so much for your time today. It's been really good fun. You're welcome. Thanks very much. All right. There he goes. Wonderful stuff. Just kind of thinking outside the box a little bit there in terms of how you can improve your club, you know, being open to everybody in your community and environment and then trying to build partnerships with people that you might, that might be mutually beneficial. Really good stuff there. Um, Brilliant. Now, uh, there's lots of good stuff as well going on over at YouTube on the Amateur Rugby Podcast channel over there. These summer series have been brilliant and I've done lots of review videos there talking about the technical and tactical stuff that's going on in the game. So get over there and give those a watch uh, if you want to see some of that. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, you can do all the social media stuff, the liking, the commenting. Uh, You know, I love all that stuff. But what I really like is if you mention it to someone in person the next time you're down your local rugby club. So until then, get out and play.